Welcome to Fort Worth 148's podcast, where we meet to discuss Masonic topics and strive to build value in the Brotherhood. The opinions and statements of the participants do not represent any positions or stance of any Grand Lodge or Lodge, and are solely the viewpoints of the participants. Master of Fort Worth 148. This is Evie Kirkendall, sitting uh, Master of Ceremonies of Fort Worth 148. And this week, uh, starting off the new year, we have a new special guest for us. And if you'd go ahead and introduce yourself for us. Hello, everybody. I'm Curtis Collier. I'm a current Master Mason at 148. It's good to be back, fellas. First episode of the year. We're we're short two hosts. Russian 2020. And... Yeah, yeah. Get it started right. Uh, uh, Billy might join us later. But Gabe's taking the night off. Totally my fault to where I let everybody uh, led everybody to believe by telling them that our first episode would be later in January and didn't realize I had put it on the schedule to do one tonight. So we're going to throw one together. Building content. Building content. Building value for our listeners, which is why they should be liking and subscribing and telling your friends. There you go. That's how you work it in. <laughs> so I don't really have a title for this one. Uh, it, it, I just, uh, when I was typing out the agenda, I just put 148 system for guarding the West Gate. And I know it's a subject we've covered a few times, but, you know, things are changing rapidly. Uh, and the Internet, especially how that all works with getting candidates. So it's something I want to go over again. And we asked Brother Curtis to come on because he was just raised, what, 72 hours ago? <laughs> uh, yeah. If that. Yeah. Uh, actually, we would have probably been close to wrapping it up right about now. Yeah, it's exactly right. Yeah, that was after a doubleheader. Um, but he's fresh through the system, you know, that we have implemented. And, you know, you've heard us guys talk about it on the other end, you know, because Evie, he affiliated, Gabe came in before that system was in place and I uh, was way before it. You know, we help implement it, but Curtis has actually been through it. So he's going to add that perspective as we go through it. It's fun perspective. So, and too. guarding the West Gate. Yeah, yeah, guarding the West Gate is something I think that I see a lot of on the Masonic Forum that I'm a part of. I hear about it on uh, other brothers' podcasts. Um, everybody's, I think, looking for a, a better mousetrap to capture the great candidates and make sure that we are um, recruiting. Well, recruiting is a bad word, but making sure that we're choosing the right people who are coming to our lodges and saying that they want to be Masons. And then at the same time, making sure that we are passing on the the people who are not ideal candidates. And um this is one of those um, episodes, I think, that I, I hope we get a lot of feedback for, from it in terms of comp Facebook feedback and, um, you know, Reddit feedback, because I think it's an important topic that we need to be talking about as Masons in the 21st century. Yeah. And I hope this episode highlights, too, how this is a work in progress for us. You know, things have changed from the system we've used forever that worked great to where somebody knew the guy that was joining, you know, with the internet, that's, that's changed. So, you know, especially for those lodges that are looking to get a web presence or already have that and get candidates from them, uh, from that, you know, or just the random walk up that happens every once in a while, uh, you know, you need to have a system in place to vet them properly compared to, you know, if I bring my cousin up there, I've known my whole life. Those, those are two different sides of the coin. But yeah, and, and that's one of the things that I think that we're noticing at 148 is how many people are finding us not necessarily through other brothers referring them or bringing them up or uh, introducing to the lo- introducing them the, uh, to the lodge, but through internet searches and secretaries of lodges receiving emails from people saying, "Hey, there's this thing that I saw on a movie, and I'm kind of interested in it. What do you guys do?" Yeah. Um, we're seeing more and more of that, and especially in in lodges like ours that have a a pretty heavy social media web um, electronic media presence. Um, it, it really brings good attention, 
And as we will probably end up discussing a little bit later, some of the, the downsides of having a presence in the community that brings yourself and your lodge attention. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned movies. They've got that uh, movie coming out for the Mighty Orphans that might actually give us a little bump in that. We need to be ready for it. You know, so it should be an interesting topic anyway. Um, Before we do get kicked off, I didn't have any discussion questions. You know, I just wanted to kind of, you know, do the teaser for the year because we do have a lot of good um, ideas for episodes lined up. Hopefully we'll be able to pull a few more of those in-person recording sessions off. You know, we've got some Grand Lodge committees that are going to come on like we've done in the past with the Committee on Work and Education where they highlight, you know, and kind of talk about what they do and how they serve Masons of Texas. So it should be a good year uh, for the podcast and, you know, help us spread the word. The more guys that listen, you know, the hopefully the more information we can spread about the craft out there, you know, and the more ideas we can get. And then also, before we move on, Texas Masonicon, by the time this is released, it's going to come out Thursday when Grand Lodge is kind of kicking off, you know, so this will give you something to listen to on your trip down there and, uh, you know, uh, get ready for the Grand Lodge special. Because that's when it will be released. When we'll sell tickets for 2020 Texas Masonicon for, uh, I think, yeah, kicking off at 45 bucks. So that's a steal. What for, a steal! Yeah, uh, we've got. I'm excited pre- for this to be my first Masonicon. Uh, it's going to be good. We've got some great speakers already lined up, confirming a few others. Uh, but things are really shaping up. I'm I'm very excited for this one. So. Should be good. There's some really exciting about Masonicon that I think that if you're not, if you were an attendee last year, you're going to be super impressed if you come to this Masonicon. It's going to be bigger. It's going to be better. It's going to have uh, more of the things you love and want it. And if this is your first one, I think it's going to be super impressive in terms of uh, the quality of education, the quality of the forum, and just how much thought and effort we're putting into the end user experience. Yeah, and don't forget the festive board. Uh, Gabe, he's pumped some steroids into that, so it should be a great time there as well. (laughs) So be on the lookout for that. You know, we'll plaster that on social media for sure. And and I know at Grand Lodge, when there's committee reports, the Facebook gets looked at pretty regularly. (laughs) (laughs) Be ready to grab you a a ticket. you know, and also I know a few of us uh, will be in certain positions that are will require us to travel the state a lot more. So keep an eye out for us. You know, we'd love to see see you and meet you out there. You know, if you see one of the hosts, Billy, Gabe, myself, Evie, uh, grab us. Let us know what you think, good or bad. We're always welcome to feedback. We always delete the bad ones anyway. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just kidding. (laughs) Well, let's jump into it. Uh, We'll start off this whole thing by, you know, I've cut most of the personal questions out because we'll kind of get into that or they don't really apply. You know, what lodge did you join? Everybody knows that. But uh, Curtis, if you would, just tell us a little bit about yourself outside the Masonic lens. Well, uh, so outside of the lodge, I have probably one of the most coveted jobs in the world. I'm actually the head taster for the Miller Coors Brewery in Fort Worth. So my job essentially consists of drinking beer most of the day. Um, (laughs) You're not 500 pounds. Right. I'm not not a behemoth of a man. Um, It's little sips here and there, but, you know, it's it's beer all day long. So I've got to make sure that our product is good before it goes out the door. And that's... Other than that, it's um, helping take care of my mom and my niece and nephew. And that's really it. It's my family and my work. Yeah, I mean, that's something else. It's like after work, everybody's like, hey, want to go grab a beer? You're like, no, no. (laughs) Right, exactly. After work, I want to go grab a whiskey. I want nothing to do with beer all week long. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. Be a good problem to have. Yeah, I know. Not. I it's it's it, it's first world problem kind of thing, right? 
Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely a choice gig. <laughs> so but what? Go ahead. It, it, it's it, it's a good fit for me, so I quite enjoy it. I bet that yeah, that's a job you wouldn't want to give up. And I will also say, having had a beer or two with you in a, in the past, because um, I was on your investigation committee. Yes. Knows more about beer than I've ever met in my life. So if if you can about a beer or what beers, this is your guy. As well, we've got a we've got a couple of, of uh, we've got a couple of guys that are that are coming up that are EAs right now that know a lot too, and it's kind of fun to sit there and chat with them. Yeah, no, that's something good. To sounds like we might need to get a homebrew team going. <laughs> mm. And Ju- and brother Justin would be a good person for that too. He used to be the head brewer at Funk Works up in Colorado. Oh wow, interesting. Yeah. I know those beers. So, uh, what inspired you to join? Um, it was a couple of things. I I, I found out that my great grandfather uh, was a mason, and I kind of sort of knew him a little bit when I was a kid. He he died when I was fairly young, uh, and he was over at the uh, the Arlington Lodge right over there on the uh, west side of Arlington. Oh yeah. Um. And isn't that, I think that one's right, pretty much right across the road from the retirement so the re- retirement home, isn't it? Yep, 438. And, uh, yeah, and uh, and I, it, it's, I felt like there was just something missing for me lately, um, just as far as, not, not really as far as my friendships go, because it, it was just a diff- different interaction that I needed with people. Mm-hmm. And... I I realize that I uh, try to try to come into the lodge before and realize it wasn't for me pretty early on and decided to take a break to see if that's what I wanted to do and then once I came back uh, this time around I just kind of realized yeah this is this is what's missing it's just there's something that's kind of hard to describe that's on the inside of me that it just clicked and I realized this is this is what was missing. Yeah, interesting. No, I like that. Uh, you know, because you, you know that's a, a good tip. You know, because you go up and you and you visit. That you know that's part of the process of letting these candidates know kind of what they're getting into, and maybe they do need more time, and maybe it's not for them altogether. You know, but mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with stepping away and then making sure it's something that's definitely going to fit into your life. Oh yeah, yeah. I think too many times guys are rushed too sure. through too quick to really make that decision. So I think it speaks to a certain degree of circumspection on Curtis's part that he recognized in a time of his life when it wasn't his time to be part of Freemasonry and stepped away for a moment and came back and realized that it was for him. Um, so often, part of the guarding the West Gate is not just about us as a lodge making sure that we are uh, choosing the people that we want in our fraternity, but it's also about making sure that the candidate knows that it's okay for you to admit that this isn't the lodge for you or that this isn't the time or the season in your life for Freemasonry. Yeah. I think that's actually one of the bigger aspects of it because once that candidate does decide that uh, and they have time to go through that whole process, then they're hooked. You know, they, they latched on. You've got them for a little while, anyway. Yeah, I, and yeah, that's that's a, a, that's exactly what happened with me. Because <clears throat> once I once I got in and realized that, yeah, this is where I need to be right now. This is for me. Then it it really was. I I falls to the wall all in. Interesting. Like it. I'm sure we'll discuss that a little more. So I know you're brand new, but I wanted to yes. ask the question anyway, and you may not have an answer and that's fine. Uh, can you give us an example of how the fraternities made you a better man? I don't think that's happened yet. Um, I, what I'm hoping happens and I'm really excited to start on this trek is um, I would like to get into the officer's rotation. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping that that helps me be a better man and a better leader of men. 
Oh yeah, it'll do that if you go online. <laughs> yeah, because that's that's something that I felt that I've been lacking in my personal life and my professional life, and I'm I just I need that extra shove. Yeah, and you know what's funny about it is I went through the chair when I went through the chairs. You know, you get in the moment, and when right after you're done with it, you don't really see the the changes that have been made and, and maybe they haven't happened at that exact time, but the, the, the metamorphosis of it has started. But the more I contemplate on my year and the things that I had to go through and the way I handle things now compared to the way I handled them then, it's all attributed to that leadership role that I had, you know, and it wasn't just worshipful master, but that was a heck of a year for me. Uh, you know, I had a lot of, uh, different things thrown my way that, you know, essentially kind of had to grow up overnight. I was like 26 years old, way too young. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I also might add to that for just a moment, Rit, um, you know, you made the point that sometimes you don't see the transformation happening mm -hmm. while it's going on. It's kind of like, you know, when you, when you lose or gain weight, you really don't notice it, especially around the holidays until somebody says, you know, hey, Tubby, how you doing? Or, hey, yeah. you're losing weight. Um, I think it's the same thing with these kind of leadership qualities. Um, and I and, and personally, I've seen, Curtis, um, some of the changes that you've that, that are already happening in you, because I remember the first time that you and I met, I really felt like you were a little bit quieter. You were more of a like a wallflower kind of sitting back. Oh, absolutely. Gauging kind of figuring 100%. it out. And now all of a sudden you're the guy who's out there helping the EA study, helping the fellow craft study. You know, you're the person who's getting uh, education together and making sure people are learning the, the, the catechism. I mean, it's, I, I think you sell yourself short uh, when you say that there really isn't a lot of change because I've seen a tremendous difference. And that could just be getting to know the fraternity a little bit better, getting to know us better. But um, I definitely see it. And I, and I see the fingerprints of the, the, the lodge all over you. Well, I think I think you're right that uh, that is part of it for sure. And the more that I hear you all talk, the more it kind of comes to the, it comes to me that I've I've realized that I've come to mature a little bit more as a man. Yeah. And it's it's something that's that 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 i have noticed and i i brought it up to my uh, previous boss at work and she had asked me what's going on i said well i'm joining the masons and she looked at me he's like oh okay and it just it made sense for her um she she had grown up in a uh rural town in arkansas and as a black woman had known about the, the prince hall masons yeah and it as soon as i said i'm joining the lodge she did an about face and said, I get it now. I understand. Interesting. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I think that's a, you know, cause you'll, you'll look back at these times, you know, as you go through it and you'll be like, Oh yeah. See where that, that growth started from, you know, cause you know, the way I deal with things in lodge are light years different, you know, cause it really puts a, a microscope on leadership because you know, everybody says, you know, it's a volunteer organization. Well, actually, we're paying to be there. You know, we pay dues to right. be there. So we feel even more entitled to give our two cents, you know, and, and we feel Correct. Like it's not like I'm going up and volunteering for the soup kitchen and leading those people. You're leading men that have paid to be there. So it's it, it puts a different edge on it. And it's uh, it's very interesting it's nothing like well i don't want to say it's nothing like work but it's different you know than it is different yeah leading a team at work different but same different but same yeah all right so let's jump into the uh <laughs> the episode content of garden the west gate um and, you know like i said before you know i want to cover this again because w when we first started getting candidates off the internet you know it was kind of a different game we went maybe six or seven years and never got anything even questionable, you know, from the internet to the last two or three years, you know, we've had some serious security risk that, you know, had we not been doing our due diligence might've slipped through the cracks. 
you know, so things are kind of ramping up in that sense. And, you know, although it may be rare that you actually get somebody, you know, that might carry out something horrible, um, there are a lot of people out there too, just messing around with, you know, I know everybody's got the uh, Illuminati, you know, join the Illuminati Facebook post or oh email. <laughs> I swear if I, I swear if I hear, if I get that post on Instagram one more time, <laughs> yeah, I see so, it like at least once a week. You know, so you've got to be vigilant and you've got to have tools in the chest to kind of discern what's real and who's real out there and, you know, learn to follow those instincts, you know, when something's not right. Uh, and how to find those things, you know, uh, because it's, it's getting different and, you know, it's getting to the point now to where more and more lodges are getting online and that will attract members because though, when they Google how to join, if you've got a website, uh, you know, a website up and you're close to them geographically, there's a good chance Google's going to put it up there, you know, somewhere in their search view to where they'll find you out. And you need to have something. Well, and even for those lodges that, that don't necessarily have, maybe they still have the, their original GeoCities uh, webpage from, you know, 1989. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, the, the Grand Lodge of Texas website now has uh, the geolocation feature. So you can go onto the Grand Lodge of Texas website, type in a zip code, and up pops, you know, um, a alphabetized <laughs> list. Um, based on where you're from, of who's closest to you, um, lodges you might be interested in, and their respective websites if they have some, or so, a contact information. Yeah. It's out there, that is for sure. Yeah, because even if you don't have a website, Grand Lodge has your info out there. So, you know, somebody can hunt you down and, you know, show up and be like, hey, I want to join. And it's not the same as, you know, if your cousin wants to join or or, you know, someone else is that they've known their whole life it, it's, it shouldn't be the same process uh and that's why i wanted to bring this up again you well know, and i think uh go ahead i think that one of the things that we that that i went through personally is um for the vast majority of of, of people who reach out to a lodge online they're probably pretty decent people um yes. if they're reaching out they they genuinely have a curiosity and that curiosity might come from they saw us in a movie. They read a book about us by, you know, somebody but like Dan Brown publishing a book about about Freemasons or has Freemasons as a as a central figure. Um, or they might have had a, a family connection like Curtis did. Or um, there's all sorts of reasons that people are going to legitimately reach out online. Um, the It's the vast majority of people are going to be good. But there's that. There's I don't even I wouldn't even say like one percent. Yeah. There's a that we and and if you have a, 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 a an online presence, you're gonna eventually get a bad apple. And if you don't, if you're not careful about it, it's it can not only be the bad apple that you know has a bad attitude or the person who brings a, an unrighteous contention into the lodge. Yeah. Um, it can be more than that. It can also be it can be risks to the yes. to the life and well-being of the people. Literal risks. So. Yeah. Um, this is an important subject that I think that um, lodges need to take seriously. And if you don't have a, an outlined process, it's something that you and your leadership team needs to sit down and really consider. Yeah, and that's key. That's something I definitely want to point out because what we have has been something that's been developing over the last almost 10 years. Uh, and it will continue to develop and it fits our culture and the way we do things at 148. So you're going to hear some things that we do that you're like, ah, that's a good idea. We could implement that. But it's not going to be a good idea to say we need to implement exactly what they're doing. You know, figure out what works with your system because you, you may not get as many candidates like we do that no one knows. But be ready for when you do you know, get them and, and what we'll go over, we'll give you a couple of tips and tricks, you know, how to kind of weed through that because it can be daunting and it is cumbersome. You know, somebody has got to be on, be vigilant, be on the ball about it. <clears throat> so before we get into our process, I, while we had Curtis on, I, I, I just want Curtis, you to start from the get go, you know, kind of like we talked earlier and just walk through the process of first coming up, how you came up, how you got invited to when you got a petition. 
Um, sure. Yeah. So I'd actually like to start about when I very first uh, came into the lodge mm-hmm. was uh, about 10 years ago, I guess. Oh, and, wow. <clears throat> you know, I had found out that my great granddad had been a Mason and decided to go ahead and try it. And I did send the email to Fort Worth 148. And uh, I don't remember who was worship master at the time, but he replied back and said, you know, yes, here's the date of our stated meeting. Come on up and, you know, meet everybody and see what you think. And that was the that was the first time I had thought about it and I walked into the stated meeting and was immediately, as soon as I stepped off the elevator, immediately I was handed a petition. (laughs) And and I just, I sat there and I had just eaten dinner. So I didn't have dinner with any of the brothers that were up there. And I just kind of looked around and I thought, you know, this, it's not my time. This isn't right for me. And I don't think I'm right for it at the moment either. So now we cut to my time at Miller, where uh, I am working with Brother Justin. And he tells me, yeah, you know, I started doing something that uh, my wife is happy about because she says it seems to be helping me because there's something that was missing. And I asked him what it was. and He said it was the Masons. I said, oh, hey, how do I do that? So he told me about the new candidate night and uh, told me about the stated meetings and said, you know what, our stated meeting is coming up, just show up, and I'll be there, and I'll introduce you to everybody. It went from there. I, it, it, <laughs> and, and once again, I was alone at the, I was alone at the uh, stated meeting, or stated dinner, because uh, Justin got stuck at work. <laughs> <laughs> so, so and, and I remember this vividly. I walked out of the elevator, and this person turned around, and it looked at me, and his eyes were the size of, dinner plates and it was it was uh our current worshipful master brother grant <laughs> and he goes oh hey who are you <laughs> and and i told him i said <laughs> no he really he those were the words out of his he's like who, who are you and i told him i said you know my friend justin told me about this and all this he goes oh great 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 well welcome 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 so i sat down and I, you know, being the introvert that I am, just kind of had to sit there and watch how everybody interacted with each other. And But, yeah, I think this is my time to start coming into this. Apparently, I joined a great group of, of guys coming through this right now. Um, I've yeah. created some friendships out of this that are fantastic. We get together whenever we can just to go out and have a couple of beers. But it, it all started with my journey on becoming a master mason is you know i sat for six months outside of the lodge room before i was handed a petition that's the part that really uh i think is most impactful um you know so when you first realized you know that you came to understood that you were going to have to you know wait you know for us to get to know you and you to get to know us uh what were you thinking you know, when you first realized that was going to happen, did you have second? I, I thought it was great. I thought it was a great thing. I thought that these, I, my, my first reaction was these guys are making me work for this, Mm -hmm. which I respect. I wholeheartedly respect. Yeah. And And, um, Curtis, uh, I've got a quick question for you uh, before you hearing your story. Now I have, this is the first time that I'm hearing kind of the continuity of the story. I've gotten, you know, and talk to you over a while, but um, how much of, of to choose this time in your life, this season of your life, of the perception of, of you know, that petition on that first time kind of shoved in your face versus you have to work for it now and you're not going to go petition at your face? How much? Uh, how much? Um, well, you're, you're cutting out again, but I get the gist or, of your question. Yeah, I think <laughs> just to kind of reiterate, it was, you know, yeah. did that make any difference with a petition being it, shoved in your face as it, opposed to... It kind of did. Um, it was weird. Like, having that handed to me as soon as I stepped out of the elevator that first time, I kind of thought, okay, what the hell's going on here? 
<laughs> and I love it. And no, I really, really did. I just and I stood there, like if you described me earlier as a wallflower. I stood there, you know, standing against the wall, holding a position, going, "What? What am I supposed to do with this?" Yeah. And versus this time, getting the petition, but having to work for the petition, it made me understand more. Yeah. So again, so you're you realize that you got to wait, and you you respect that. It kind of it's starting to build value for you in a way, is what I'm, what yes. I'm getting at. Yes, yes, very much so. So you're at about month four or five, and it's not like we were giving you updates. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, right? It's not right. like six months. So you're at about month four or five. What are you thinking then? Are you thinking? Or that's when I'm getting. That's when I'm getting all antsy and antsy, and I just kind of I go, all right, you know, look, <laughs> these guys. It, it actually, you know, it was weird how it crescendoed. Like I got, I got really antsy and, and just thought these guys need to give me this position now because I just want to get on with this. I I, I know I want to do this. I really want to do this. But then, after about a week or so of being worked up about it, it dropped off, and I kind of thought, okay. I see again why they're doing this because, yeah. you know, there is, I kind of think that natural sense in people after doing something for so long, so long that they want the reward for that. And if you don't immediately get the reward when you want it, you've got a couple of reactions. You can go, all right, fine. I get what they're, you know, you can calm down and say, I get what they're trying to do. Or you can get all worked up about it, and then you know that's when we kind of realize that you, you may not be a good candidate for us. Man, you just hit the nail. And wasn't on the that head. love it? Go um, ahead, Evie. That it was like your core group of guys that had been coming. In. All of a sudden, there was two to three or four more guys that started joining y'all's group in that uh, in that uh, ante room out there um, around the table, and. It seemed to me from an outsider looking in that, that that there was like some growing pains about having this core group of guys who knew each other and then suddenly having these new people that were not part of y'all's group. And was that some of the the reason that you suddenly um, realized what this whole process was about? Because that kind of – I saw what was going on out there from an outsider's <clears throat> perspective, and I felt like some of the people that were on the – like you were saying, the antsy people – suddenly kind of calmed down all of a sudden and realized why we're doing what we're doing. I, I think so. Um, cause out of, out of the current, uh, out of, out of, or out of not the current, but out of this core group of, of guys that came in, I was the last one. There were a few stragglers that came in here and there. Um, and actually one of which I think he might've been one of the anti guys. He got a petition the first time he showed up. And I haven't seen that guy since. But also, everybody else that showed up that was kind of antsy about it, I haven't seen them since either. Like They may have showed up once or twice after, but they've pretty much cut out. Yeah. And there was a gap between, you know, this core group with me and the next group that's about to come in. Yeah, because it was several months between us um, inviting a couple of other guys upstairs and we'll get into the whole process of that. I think in a little bit, a little bit more, um, mm -hmm. in a little bit. Uh, but there was a there was a, a quite a gap, if I'm not mistaken, like a month between your your core group. We had some stragglers, but then there was like a new group of people that just kind of showed up. Yeah, and uh, we, that we invited up, and it was it was interesting seeing that core group of guys react to this new group of newbies coming in that were like, I, it was almost like the the cool kids looking over at the the new kids in the lunchroom going, what are you guys doing? That's the best way to it put was it. Pretty, <laughs> it was pretty funny to watch from an outsider. I don't know if you, if you saw that writ or not, but it was, it was pretty funny to watch. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I, you know, the, the things you see through that process. No, I, I, I definitely saw that. And it was, it was a case of the cool kids looking at the new kids coming in. But it also changed to a case of the cool kids going, hey, come over and sit at our table. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. And it really, um, that that was, yeah, I definitely saw that happen too. That was pretty cool. So you're, you're finally through that process and you get handed a petition. 
how do you feel there? I feel like it was worth it. Um, I mean, it, it, it was, it was, it was a very weird kind of muted elation at getting the, <clears throat> at getting the petition. It, 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 it seemed like all of this work that I had put into being and changing and interacting, it came, it all came to fruition. You know, uh, so to just kind of continue this question line and to kind of skip ahead, um, after your initiation, and this is total speculation, do you think since you had time to get to know all of us, I mean, we were on a first name basis by the time you're initiated, mm -hmm. we've known you mm -hmm. for almost a year. Do you think that made the degree that much more special? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, I wish that I could go back and start it all over. <laughs> I kind of do. I really kind of do. Cause I want to see how the now me would interact with all of this. Yeah, we'll get get ready. Buckle up, baby. It's a bumpy road. <laughs> we got plenty of more challenges. <laughs> it's a rough and rugged road. <laughs> uh, uh, so is there anything else that stands out to you before we kind of dive into our process? <clears throat> um, Something about really. the process that maybe you really thought was cool or thought mm, that part can be tweaked, you know? Well, actually, yeah, there is, there is one thing and, mm -hmm. um, Britt, I love your dad. Brother Billy is an amazing person. Mm -hmm. Change out who sits up there with us occasionally. I think you're, you, you, yeah. Cause that's something that we have definitely talked about the, the thing that that boils down to is willing bodies to do that. And yeah, yeah, I, I understand that. And, and, and like I say, don't get me wrong. It was, he was the person that I sat with 98% of the time when I was yeah. going through the process. And it was, it was very informative and very enlightening listening to him because he knows a lot. No, and he's good at the process of asking the right open-ended questions and listening because that's the thing yeah. is that you can get guys that will go out there and sit with the candidates, but you, you know, as, as someone who's kind of real integral in this process, you'll observe them doing that. You'll be sitting there at the, and you see them doing 90% of the talking and ain't nobody getting to know these candidates. Yeah. You, you know, so it's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight and guys are getting better and better at it. You know, that's why we keep that new candidate night to just a certain, you know, guys that, it, you know, know what we're looking for and how to get uh -huh. it out of the guys. But that's right. something we definitely need to look at, you know, because as this, as we get further and further into this process and more and more guys understand what we're trying to do, I think we're going to have more guys out there. Uh -huh. You know, and rotate that through. But yeah, I got that down on my notes. I'll be bringing that up. <clears throat> so let's break down this process that we've got mm -hmm. and the way that it typically works. Because yours was a little unique in that you knew uh, Brother Reniger and he kind of brought you in. And, and, you know, Justin was new, so you still went through the vast majority of the process. But the way that it typically works for us is that we just get a random email. And they're typically very short. There's, you know, we get their name and it's not their full name either. It's whatever name they want to give us because, you know, they're contacting us from the website, which has them put their name and email and then a message. And it's typically, I uh, want to join the brotherhood. They might say something like grandpa was or something like that, but it's typically like, I want to be a part of something bigger. Uh -huh. When we get that email, um, I'm typically the one handling those to where I'll Google the name and their email and any other information that I can get from them, you know, if they happen to mention where they live or anything and just do kind of initial quick, is there anything crazy out there that pops up, you know, cause you usually don't get a lot of info on that email. Every once in a while, you'll get a picture with their Gmail or something like that. You know, a profile picture that you can kind of maybe go find them on social media. But 
you know, after I do that initial check, which <clears> typically <throat> don't find anything, I'll send them out a, uh, a survey. So they get, it's up to about 60 questions now. And most of it's pretty basic, but I want to go over what we, what we put into this survey and we'll kind of expound on some of the bigger ones, but, uh, start off, we ask for legal name, full legal name, uh, contact info and their address, their date of birth, their marital status. We ask if the wife supports him joining or the spouse supports him joining, um, their employer's name and contact info to verify their employment. And it's one thing to say where you work, but if you think I'm going to call your boss and verify your employment, you know what I mean? It, it's taking it up a little bit. Uh, we ask them if they've been, <clears throat> if they are or have been in the armed forces, <clears throat> if they're a first responder or if they work at a public school. Because if that's the case, you know, if they're current military or, you know, uh, reserves, first responder, public, they've had background checks. So you've got a good idea that they're probably pretty clean on that aspect. Um, then we'll ask them, how did they find us? <clears throat> Typically it's a Google search, but how did they find our lodge specifically? Um, have they inquired with any other lodges, which is something that we promote, uh, although it doesn't happen a whole lot. They've got, usually got a pretty good reason why they're coming to our lodge, which is great, but we are very, you know, we want them to find the right path for themselves. Um, do they know any Masons? If they do, list their name and contact info and let them know we're going to give them a call. Uh, we have questions on there that confirm they have a belief in a higher power and the immortality of the soul. You know, the basic things that will immediately disqualify you. Uh, so we don't want to be wasting anybody's time. We ask them if they have any felonies or crimes other than minor traffic violations. And the very next question after that is we have them consent to a background check and provide their driver's license number and state it's issued. Granted, we don't do that and we definitely should start, but you, you know, I think that you'd be surprised at that, you know, that that actually would be a little bit of a deterrent. Because we've had many guys, you know, come through that have had silly stuff, you know, on their on their record, and they're upfront from the get go about it, you know. Um. So uh, we go over quite. We have questions that go over the process uh, as far as time commitment and financial commitment, dues, degree fees, things like that, and that it's not just a pay and you're out, you know, you got the title kind of thing. There's a lot of work in it. Uh, we explain there to be a home visit and that we, if they have a spouse, we want them there. Uh, we'll schedule towards that. Uh, the day we meet, if that jives with them, because that's probably one of the biggest factors of us finding someone in another lodge is that they just, they can't meet on Monday nights. We confirm they understand we accept uh, all races and most religions. Um, but the big one that we've added recently is three character references that are non-Masons. We just want character references. So if you don't know a Mason, uh, even if you do, we still want three additional character references. And <clears throat> that's just been something that we've recently added. And it has slowed our candidate in the last month and a half, it has considerably halted the amount of people that fill out that form. So is that in addition <clears throat> to the three, the other three uh, Mason references? So, yes, that's totally different because you, what you're talking about is on the petition. And when it comes to that, you know, we'll get those for you when you go through the whole process. Right. Um, but if you do know a Mason, we ask them that in the form. And we want to know them. We'll contact them. But we also want character references. And they could be Masons if you know them. That's fine. Um, but 
by and large, most people join might know a Mason, you know, that they kind of, yeah, my boss is, I saw his ring, but they don't know him well enough to put him down as a character reference. But they'll have others that they can put for that. It's definitely slowed things down, which is a good thing. It's a good thing because, well, I mean, we'll go over the stats later in the show, but, the, you know, the, when it comes to the percentage of guys that actually email and make it, it's not very high. So this is just another way to weed out that, you know, not waste their time and vice versa. Um, and, and that's something that I think every lot should consider putting in if they don't know the guy. Because there's nothing, you know, we have that freedom per Grand Lodge law to add these additional aspects to our investigation process, especially for guys that we have, no one knows them from Adam. I 100% agree with all of that, too, especially seeing as the world's changing now. I think yeah. That's, I think that's a great way to go. No, and, then, and also, um, except for my character references, because <laughs> I don't trust those guys. So I think that there are probably some brothers who are out there listening to us uh, growing on about this really lengthy process, kind of rolling their eyes going there. We get one petition every six months. Why would we put somebody through this? Chances are it would drive them away more so than anything else. Mm -hmm. But I think that for context, people have to remember that our, our particular lodge is just outside of downtown uh, Fort Worth. It's a huge building. It's a Masonic temple. It's ginormous, and it puts a giant, giant uh, target on us in a, in positive ways, but also in negative ways. So when we're going through these things, um, keep in mind that our, the context of our lodge might be a little different than the context of yours. And some of these, um, the degrees to which we're taking this might be a little extreme for your context, but don't take it for granted, though, that you might not be in an area that gets weirdos like we do. Yeah. So I, keep I, that in mind. I would take everything with a grain of salt. No, and I think that's a perfect way of putting, you know, kind of what I let off with, fit it to your culture. Because you're exactly right. You know, in a smaller town to where you might be able to get a little information, you know, it, it, having them wait six months, you, you're not going to get anybody. So be smart about it. But there are things you can implement, you know, other things just aside from that um just to kind right. of round out that survey uh the last couple of things we ask um we ask them to expound on ma a major accomplishment in their life and a major disappointment and how they overcame it uh that gives you kind of a chance to see how they put their thoughts together uh how they articulate things you know uh, and and kind of gives you some maybe a 10,000 foot view of where they're coming from as a person, uh, a link to their social media and a profile pic. Uh, that way, if they do get invited up, we know who to look out for. And you've got all this information, you know, and this was all developed because of safety concerns. But <clears throat> what we found out that this information that you compile, you're getting to know this guy on a level that you wouldn't have if he hadn't filled this out. So when this guy does become a member, you know him that much better. You know, you you know where he's going to fit in, that he's here to be on the charity team or he's a ritualist. You know, you start getting those inclinations from gathering this kind of information. The key, though. And it also gives us a sense of if they've given us answer A during this process and suddenly we get answer B during getting the know them process, it gives us a basis for comparison to know, is this person telling us what we want to hear? Mm -hmm. Are they fibbing to us or are they being consistent with the, the narrative that they're sharing with us? Yeah, that's a good point too. I mean, there's nothing wrong with collecting data. It can only serve you well, you know, if you go back and review it and use it. So, you know, create your own survey for these, these moments, you know, it's, it may not be needed every time in your lodge. Um, but, it's going to serve you well, you know, on those times you need it. Um, the key to the whole survey, though, is that we collect information to really do a thorough search on the Internet with them. 
you'll be surprised at how many free background check things there are for public records and stuff like that, you know, to kind of make sure they're not a, a hardened criminal. Uh, what social media will tell you, because you can go look at somebody's profile and it's like, hmm, this is kind of questionable. And you start digging through his friends list, you know, because you can quickly tell who he converses with, you know, those top friends. You can find out a lot about what he's doing. Things may be on his friends page that aren't on his, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. This guy's about to be a member of your lodge. You better look in every nook and cranny you can find. So, LinkedIn. and also uh, websites like the Texas Sex Offender Registry website. Mm -hmm. um, that's a free a free database. You can just pop in, check uh, information that they've given you across that, and you can see if they crop up on websites like that. Um, fortunately, we've never had anything like that happen. But yeah. those are free resources that are out there for lodges to check, and that's definitely a disqualifier if they happen to be on that website. So, yeah, keep that in mind. When you got their full legal name and date of birth, you you can find some pretty interesting things and and cross check some information that they've given you. Uh, so it's a it, that's a very helpful tool to have. All that we do all that after they fill out the survey before we ever respond to them. And if they pass the mustard test at that point and don't have you know something silly on their Facebook page that would disqualify them, they get invited up for uh, what we call new candidate night but it's kind of being rebranded to prospect night because we're trying to discern who has a petition and who doesn't so a candidate would have a petition in our lodge and a prospect is working on it i kind of like that actually yeah because it gets confusing uh especially when we had nine and ten of you sitting around the table you know it's like who who's a member and who's not right <laughs> you know because they, the once a monthers, you know, they just, they wouldn't know. Yeah. It's kind of helped discern things. Um, but when they, uh, when they're invited up on that first Mondays, they're invited into the basement meeting room. So they don't get to see that building. They literally walk in the door and hang an immediate right. So they see the basement doors and the conference room down in the basement. And they meet usually two, maybe three of our brothers there that have been trained on, you know, asking the right questions and to all that good stuff. Um, but they don't even get in the door until they show a picture ID. That's something new that we've implemented here recently as well, because it's easy to go online and pose as somebody else. You can be the perfect candidate, you know, with a little Google search on any name that you know what I'm saying. Uh, so we want a valid ID and that'll get you in the door, you know, so you, they'll sit down with these guys for about an hour or so. And it's basically just like, a, you know, uh, hair on the back of your neck, stand up check, you know, it, cause there's no way we're going to get to know them in a night, but you know, the basic stuff, do they have a place to live? Do they support themselves? Can they put sentences together? Uh, are they not just overall squ scary in quotation marks? You know, um, I think we've only had one guy that didn't make it past that. Most of the time guys make it through that and, process, but not always. And one of the interesting things it's about, um, I actually am a recent joiner of the team that is down there um, interviewing these people. And one of the first things that we tell them is our job down there is to try to get you not to join our lodge. <laughs> um, because we would much rather have you there than your money. And we want to make sure that they know what they're getting into and that we get rid of all of their illusions about, um, uh, about what being a Freemason is and find out what they think that Freemasonry is all about. And um, I think you and, and brother Witt are excellent at that. And Jamie too. I don't think you've gotten to, to interact with Jamie lately, but, uh, I've he's not. definitely, he digs into them and really um, we, we really have a, a great, great camaraderie down there that really gets a sense. But we tell them up front, we, we might want you, but we don't need you. I right. That line, yeah. And that, that is a, that is a, an important thing for them to understand. I think it's also important. That was an important realization for us to understand that 
regardless of what our membership is, whether we are um, a small lodge, whether we are a large lodge, whether we are <clears throat> wanting to get new members and grow, or whether we're where we want to be and happy with the group that we got, it doesn't matter. Um, we have to be willing to say to people, no, you're not a right fit for us. Yeah. And it doesn't, and, and, and we might need people. We might even want people, but we're not going to compromise our integrity to, um, to fulfill membership numbers. Yeah. And so um, us admitting that and saying it out loud was an important part of the development of this entire process, I think. No, and I think that's crucial to highlight because I, you know, I tell the guys always when I'm training them how to investigate and stuff, it's like, dude, do your due diligence because once they're in, there's no getting them out. You know, they like have to really do something serious to get them out, but they could be a severe thorn in your side, just not work with the team well kind of person that just throws a monkey wrench in everything you try to do and you can't get anything done. And, you know, getting to know guys. And the other side of that coin, mm -hmm. well, I was going to say Rick, that the other side of that coin is that we get a, I mean, I've heard it from, from um, brothers in our lodge that that are there is this process going on that might serve as like, because we kind of almost act as gatekeepers for our Westgate. The, mm -hmm. those of us that are down in that, in that room interviewing people. And so we have to be very diligent when we walk out of there and the candidate, these new prospects have left. Um, we are looking at each other saying, uh, with the criteria, does this person meet the scary factor? Yeah. Are they someone that could potentially be not just a member of our lodge, but could they be a Mason? And that's yeah. the, that's the criteria that we are holding them to. And it helps us get out of our mind and get out of that, that would we vote for them in a petition situation? Because our job down there isn't to make sure that. Um, every single person that comes through is going to be a part of our lodge or that we want to make sure that they have a certain look or a certain sound or a certain this or a certain that. Um, we're not trying to evaluate candidates on that criteria. We're just trying to weed out the crazies and yeah. make sure that everyone that comes up, we can trust that they're not going to do something wacky. Yeah, because there are, you know, it's very, very far and few between, but there are guys that you'll meet and it's like, you, there's no reason to waste your time. You know, you're just not at a point. In life Absolutely. That you're ready, you know, and that's what that that night kind of weeds out um, because it, it is. It's very rare that someone didn't make it through that. Um, but after they do go through that candidate night and they sit there with you guys, you know, y'all leave them with, hey, we'll be in contact with you. Uh, you know, so just hang tight. Uh, we're going to deliberate and we'll get back to you. And they're not left hanging long, usually about a week or two to where we all kind of get together and you guys let me know, give me the thumbs up, thumbs down, and I'll send them the email that will invite them up on Mondays regularly uh, and give them info on where to come meet, you know, on our, on which floor and those kind of things, you know, to where they'll know where we're at. Cause up to this point, they've seen nothing of that building. They wouldn't have a clue, you know, where to even begin to go. Um, once they're invited up, that's when the, that's when the real magic starts for me because <clears throat> we started the whole process because the guy that joined, you know, we got to know, uh, was a little bit crazy and it was like, uh, well, he didn't join. He tried to join. Uh, he ended up being a little bit crazy or maybe a lot crazy. And we realized, man, we got to make guys wait. You know, this is getting out of hand, you know, keep ourselves safe. But that what we coined as the six month period, which usually turns into longer, uh, you know, guys have really seemed to have gotten a lot of value out of it because the, the men that we have that have gone through that and become m members of the lodge, they seem to stay more active. I think I can attest to that personally. Yeah. You know, because I, I've been through a lot, you know, my lodge at one point, you know, we we would lose four out of every 10 EAs we raised. And that, that's not the case anymore. I say raised, initiated for we'd lose we'd lose almost half of the EAs. They wouldn't even progress. Yeah. Well, and also, since we started keeping track of how often they're attending, 
we get a really good sense of what their attendance is going to be like. We have new candidate night uh, or new prospect night every Monday that, that the lodge is that, that we're there yeah. because the, the rest of us are either doing, we're doing education, we're doing degrees, we're doing something. There's something going on at the lodge almost every Monday and new candidate night is one of those things. Yeah. And we get a sense of, are they going to be there? Are they diligent? Are they on time? Not that we're really checking timeliness. We're seeing how, how, how their time management is. Are they coming? Are we getting to know them? Or are they showing up, you know, like once here and once there? Because they're the here and nowers, you know, we want them. If they're the, the every other or, you know, every other month we're seeing them, yeah. those are the people that it's probably not the season for them. No, you're yeah, exactly and, right. you know, I, I got to say, I, I kind of agree with your assessment on the on the losing like 50% of them coming up because after uh, after I got my petition and I started looking at who all was coming up, it seemed like everybody that came up after me until this new group that's about to come in has disappeared. Yeah. So there are, and I, I did the, I started counting them. There's seven of us or well, uh, seven folks that are, that were initiated within the same time frame. And I have seen at least seven people come up that were trying to petition the lodge. And I haven't seen them at all after one or two meetings. Yeah. And see back in the old days when we used to hand you a petition, getting off the elevator, they would, <laughs> they would have become an EA and we would have lost them. So uh -huh. we've, we've flip flopped that, you know, that we're still losing guys, but it's not on the books. You know, and right. they're not Masons. They're not out there saying, yeah, I tried that. It was boring. Yeah, there's nothing to that. They just do a little blue, blah, blah. And it, yeah, it's no big deal. We don't have those guys anymore. You know, they're they're saying to people, yeah, I tried to join, but I couldn't get in, which I like a lot better. You know, that's better advertising than, yeah, it's just, it's totally not cool. I did that. It's yeah. just a little something yeah. or nothing, you know not being able to get in sounds a little and, more like, Oh, it sounds interesting. And it also takes away the fact that we're not putting any work into these guys until we know for sure that they are ready. One of the things that I've heard lots of, lots of lodge uh, lodges complain about um, is that they've put all, they've invested all this time, all this energy into a candidate into, you know, putting the degrees together um, making sure that um, that they are, you know, progressing, that they are learning their catechism, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden they disappear. Yep. And this process eliminates them before the lodge puts any work into them, before there's a degree team put together, before there's any catechism work put together. We've essentially weeded out about, what, 90% of the people who eliminate later on. Yeah. You know, so it really eliminates our back end work by putting a little bit of extra work on the front end. You're, you're exactly right because this group with me was, it, we are the ones that kept us all together. Yeah. It's not like we didn't interact with you at all, but we interacted with, uh, in, in our own little click, we interacted with each other more than we interacted with y'all. And it seemed like we were pushing each other to, Go ahead and get this done. Yeah, there is, that's something I've definitely noticed is that you'll have what, what my dad and I call classes, you know, to where there's definitely something to that process of having us get to know the guys. But there's just so many side effects that happen from that that it's like I, I'm sold on it. You know, it, 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 it seems a whole lot like the Montessori way of teaching stuff like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this. And the kids are like, what are you doing over there? Yeah. And they just kind of follow. And that's that's exactly what happened with all of us. Like I say, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's it's all good that we're getting out of this six months. Uh, but every once in a while, it does come up to where we actually find something that's like, hey, you know, we've either got to pull the guy aside and say, you know, you you this is not for you. You're not coming up anymore. Or even in worst case scenario, like this guy doesn't need to be a Mason at all anywhere. And right. he, you know, would be dealt with accordingly. Um, but, 
you know, without that time process, there's, uh, you know, several instances I can think that, you know, we have dodged some major bullets on, uh, you know, ha- bringing guys in that would have been trouble. You know? So on the, on the lesser side of that though, like having somebody sit through the whole six month period and realize that they're going to be a good Mason, but they're not going to be a good fit for us. Mm-hmm. Um, how is it? How is it trying to find them? Maybe a new a new lodge to land at. Uh, that's actually usually pretty easy. Uh, we've actually okay. had we've actually experienced that very recently, and you know, mm-hmm. the guy that you know it wasn't a good fit for us is already petitioning at another lodge because you know I go to that lo- I went to that lodge personally, and I was like, look, here's what <clears throat> we've done with this candidate. And they're like, oh my gosh, he's been, you know, vetted three times over. And I, you know, tell him I'll vouch for him. You know, we've got other guys that'll vouch for him, you know, and put us down as references and they're like, let's get him going. You know, so there's ways to, you know, make that transition happen very smoothly, but you know, you just got to be there for the guy. You know, the ball gets dropped on that so many times. And ultimately, it's funny how those things work out, you know, because when I went over there, he just hit it off with the guys over there. Great personality fit. You know, it's, I just sat back and I was like, man, you know, it's it's weird how these things transpire to work out for the best. It's always great. And I also yeah. think, and I also think that it's a, a testament to the fact that even though we have worked this process of bone, I'm we have sit, spent around and burned some serious neural energy trying to get this process as streamlined and as efficient and as uh, as as fine of a net to catch the people we need to catch no. as we possibly can. But there's still there's no perfect mousetrap. Um, we're still constantly trying to to find the way to find the perfect mousetrap so that no balls get dropped like that where um, we're getting the right people and we're making sure that those people are the right fit for who our lodge is and, and what we're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, it is it, certainly a heck of a process to go through and then just be told no. And you know, that's things that we got to make sure that we refine there as well, you know, because it's kind of a live and learn uh, process, you know, cause we're getting better at it to identify guys. It's like, mm-mm. It's not going to work, you know, either let's get you hooked up at another lodge or you come back later, you know, whatever the case may be. And in one of the the rules that we had uh, whenever I was in the military and as an air traffic controller, basically every rule that we had for air traffic control was the result of a plane crash or something going really horribly awry in the air traffic control system. And that's kind of what this system that we've developed is where we've encountered a problem and we've tried to implement a process that will catch that problem at the appropriate time. Yeah, that's a good analogy for sure. So when they get through that six month period and we converse with each other at the lodge, you know, because no one person is the petitioner hand or outer uh, for lack of a better word, but we talk to each other, Hey, you know, Curtis has been coming up for six, seven months. I like him. What do you guys think? We kind of spitball that around the room. And when we come to the consensus, we'll go give that guy a petition. And I've had on several occasions, you know, to where the guys, one time I walked out and gave a guy a petition and he got a round of applause from the other guys working on their petition out there. I've gotten a hug before, you know, I've seen eyes get filled with, you know, water when I've handed petitions. And it's like that never happened in all my years. And it was all created through that process they just went through. And I- yeah, it was. Um, because I can say that each person in this group that I came up with has gotten a round of applause. And yeah. I remember when... There were a couple of guys on the same night that got their petition and we all were just like, you know what, that's fantastic. Gave them a round of applause and took them out and their drinks were on us that night. Yeah. You know, we went out, had a couple of beers and they didn't pay for anything. And 
it, it it was it was the same thing with me because I remember that you were the one that actually came out and handed me my petition, and I was not expecting that at all. Yeah. And I just I remember this huge grin came across my face, and everybody goes, "All right, we're going to the we're going to the flying saucer. That's it. We're we're going." And I couldn't even say no. Yeah. No. So I'm that's like... kind of the camaraderie and brotherhood that built up through that six months is. You know, yes, I may be ahead of the folks that I came in with, but whether I'm ahead of them or not, they're still my brothers. Yeah. No, it's interesting the bonds that are built there uh, through that through that time period. And you know, I kind of equate it to a, a, a rite of passage. You know, that's what Freemasonry is all about: is uh, finding new levels of yourself. And when you have moments like that as artificial as it may be you know that we've created to where you're proud that you got that petition it's a moment of reflection of man i did it i put in all this work you know i did this i did that you know i'm i'm proud of myself and and you know what i i was very proud of myself to the point that, that i was peacocking a little bit that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i really was you know uh, and i realized that everybody <laughs> everybody that I was with had also gotten their petition, but I'm still like, look at me. I yeah. just got this, yeah. you know, and it felt good to get that though. No. And that's a great, that's a great state of mind to start your Masonic journey on, you know, cause you got a lot of work ahead of you, but you've already, oh, yeah, you do. you've already shown yourself that, you know, Hey, I stick to it. I'm going to get through this, you know, a little patience. Um, so once they get that petition, you know, that's when the typical investigation starts, you know, where you get the old form that you check the box, which <coughs> man, you got to be careful with that. Um, you can add to that all you want as well. Cause we, uh, you know, we don't insist, but we highly encourage our investigation team to look over social media, to talk to each other, uh, to kind of redo all these things that we've done. Maybe something news popped up, um, but to get to know this guy, so when you go on that house visit, you've got some relevant open-ended questions to ask him, something that he might be interested in, you know, those kind of things to connect with him, to make him feel comfortable and really open up with you. Um, but we do, we are pretty stringent on the home visits, you know, because that's something that you can get a lot of information from a home visit without the guy ever saying a word, you know? Yeah. You really, really, really can. Yeah. Um, I had, I, so on my investigation committee, my home visit was, uh, our worshipful master, it was brother Grant. Mm -hmm. And I actually was a little petrified of him coming to my house. Yeah. Um, and it's not that, it's not that it's because of who I am. It's because it's a much older house that I am working on redoing. So it, it is in a shambles right now. Yeah. And so I just kind of sit here and think, Oh crap. You know, he's, <laughs> he's going to think he's going to think I'm just some hoarding, messy, horrible person. Yeah. But you know, I, Take him to where we're both going to be comfortable. And he, he, you know, once, yeah, he sees everything that's going on in my house. But once he sits down with me, he also realizes, oh, okay, I, I get it. I understand. Yeah. No, and that's, I think that's the best part of the home visit is you can, you can see what's going on initially, but then you can also get a sense of what's going on with the person that's living there. Yeah. And I mean, um, like, I mean, this story may sound made up, but the, you may meet the nicest guy in the world and then go on the home visit and he's got a portrait of Adolf Hitler in his home. And it's like, oh, we've got an issue. And you would have right. never known that right. had you not <laughs> gone to his house. <laughs> wow, that, that escalated quickly. Yeah, I mean, and we're talking about one-offs, but that's the thing is that we need to do our due diligence to make sure those one-offs don't happen. 
uh, you know, and, and that home visit, you know, when you're there talking to them, you know, it's not like you're going to, uh, go snoop around stuff, but you can see things in that house and, you know, how they present themselves, how they welcome you, you know, all those kind of things culminate into your complete picture of his character. The more information you can get about him, the better, you know, um, and, and not to mention, you're going to learn a lot of his interest. So when he does become a member, you're going to know, hey, man, I saw a bunch of books about World War II in your place. You know, are you a history buff? Oh, well, we've got great right. history. Right, that, that can take two routes, can't it? Yeah, that's the truth. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's just crucial to really do your due diligence on it uh, because it's so easy to get lax on this kind of thing. You know, especially with the the constant membership drives we have, um, and that's not just our grand jurisdiction; that's everywhere. You know, um, I was talking with our uh, incoming grand master of tradition prevails, and he had the term, you know, that we can have quantity and quality both if we do our job right, and I, I believe that to be true, hundred percent. You know, because we've when I think we, of that, our system is a testament to that very fact. Yes. Um, That's exactly it, right. We have our lodge is growing, yeah. and we are getting more and more applicants and more and more prospects every single day. And it's not because we've made the system easier. If anything, mm -hmm. we've made it way harder. Yeah. It's not because we've diminished the amount of time that you're waiting. It's because we've increased the amount of time. It's not because we've decreased dues fees or um, initiation fees. We've kept them the same, and to make sure that we're covering expenses. We have made it valuable, and that's the key to making sure that this process is working. And what so many people out there, um, you know, it's the antithesis of what what has been happening in masonry for what decades now. That it's been mm -hmm. let's let's make it easier, let's make it faster, let's make it more streamlined. Get people, you know, blue lightning them, and you know, make giant groups of of men a master masons. That's not the answer. That doesn't create, that doesn't increase value to people. And while I know that there's plenty of studies out there that show that those Masons are just as active and there's just as much um, falloutism as there is with, uh, you know, the way that we're doing it now, mm, I think yeah. the unintended consequences of that are better men, more um, value of the craft mm. and more impact from our ritual. Yeah, and you know, you, you bring up a good point because a lot of people show the statistics of the, you know, the the day masons, for lack of a better term, uh, because they are, they're masons, they're masons, they were just raised a different way, but the, the statistics on them staying active compared to the regular way, uh, because we're not doing it the regular way, that to me almost is apples to apples because you know, what was the difference in becoming a Mason in a one day uh, festival compared to becoming a Mason in three months? You know, the whole process from start to finish in three months, you know, there's not a big difference in value building there. Um, but when the process takes almost a year just to get to your initiation date and knocking on that door, there's been a little more time to build value. I, you know, you know, I gotta say, I, I, I agree with that. And I've talked to one of my friends recently who he is a master Mason out of Alabama. Mm -hmm. Um, he is here in the Metroplex and hasn't joined a lodge here in the Metroplex, but I told him how many people we have coming up right now. Yeah. And he is genuinely surprised at how many people we have. <laughs> and he told me flat out, he said, look, in world war two, that would have been nothing. Yeah. The, the number of guys that you have in your group right now, that would have been like a Wednesday or something yeah. like that. <laughs> That's the truth. You know? <laughs> yeah, that would have been one week worth of raising guys. Yeah, you know? exactly. And and he says, but in 2020, that's very impressive to have that many, that many people coming up. And especially with, you know, waiting period and yeah, just everything that we've instituted. No, there's no well, doubt. Well, I think maybe the lesson... Maybe the lesson here is because, like you said, Rit, there are plenty of statistics that show that the one day Masons, they're, and, and I freely and, and not just freely, but strongly acknowledge that these are Masons too, that they're not, 
somehow inferior in any way. Yeah. I think the lesson that comes from this is that if your system is thoughtful, it feels planned, it feels intentional, prospective members are going to notice that and it's going to make them want to stay part of it. So yeah. if your system is a one day Mason program, but it has been thoughtfully designed so that it is intentional, it is demonstrably intentional to the people who are going through it, then, then that's just as valuable as what we're doing by having designed the thoughtful system. The, the system that seems to be failing in, in my, my opinion is the system that isn't well thought out. That is the, you get off the elevator and you get handed a petition. Yes. That's not a thoughtful system. No, that's, I, that's I, incidental. That's yeah. easy. And that's where people are going to start falling off. Yeah, I could agree with that. Yeah. Cause, uh, you know, it is, I'm, I'm a perfect example of that. Yeah, that's the truth. You know, but I, I think that you could, it, it is all about having a well thought out system in place that people can recognize, Hey, there's been some real thought put into this. That's impressive. That's what they're looking for. You know, so it, it, I think that's a good point to highlight because, you know, a lot of times it, you, we get in that mode of what's the pro what's the program we're going to be doing or what system do we do next? You know, that's going to save us. It's really and truly going to be unique to every one of us because what works in Fort Worth. One of the, one of the things that's really, it's really come up to me um, lately that I have been really cooking my noodle about is um, the idea of there's so many questions being asked out there in the craft about how do we get better members? How do we get more members? Mm -hmm. And I will respectfully say that I think that those people who are asking that question are asking the, the, the exactly wrong question because we know how to do this. We've done it before. We yeah. know what success is. It doesn't take a PhD in organizational management to understand what makes for a good striving, a, a good uh, thriving organization. The question that people should be asking is that they should be finding the better why. Um, I, there's a great movie out there that I watched uh, many years ago, and um, it's a it's a classic story of good versus evil. And there's a character who the evil character is trying to. Uh, persuade this fella to join his side and the guy that he's trying to persuade asks him why are we doing this and the the bad guy says why are you asking why when how is so much easier and that's the problem that i think illustrates the problem of what's going on right now we're asking how when we already know how and it's getting in the the way of asking the really important question which is finding the better why yeah. the, the better why to why are we doing what we're doing why are we trying to get better create a system that is efficient but but strongly weeds out those undesirable candidates why are we doing it get your lodge a better why and you'll have better processes that the how is incidental the why is the important question to ask yep no and those whys seem to come that's out that's every soapbox for the night <laughs> no, and once you start developing your lodge culture and you realize, hey, this is the route we're headed. This is what we're all about. It's a lot easier to identify that why. You know, because that, that's like you say, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're doing golf tournaments. If you're doing the best golf tournaments, men are going to be attracted to that. If you're a ritualist lodge and you're doing good ritual, men are going to be attracted to that. But if it's all mediocre, not well thought out, you know, nobody really wants to be a part of that. I get, I got, I got plenty of that. I got a hole in my couch from my, my mediocreness. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, I, 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 I agree. It, it seems like you want the people who are asking themselves, "Why am I doing this?" Yeah. No, that's exactly right. That's the, guy, the kind of guys we're looking for. And when we, you know, we don't vet these guys in any, you know, any f real fashion, we're letting in guys that just, you know, Johnny come lately's, you know, and don't really have the wherewithal to dig into masonry or anything, 
you know, to make it successful. So, you know, we got to be vigilant because, you know, something I've learned from this is that, yeah, we could turn this faucet on and we could be initiating 35, 40 guys a year. We'd probably still be raising 10 or 12 a year. Uh, and we could turn that money faucet on, but you know, I would much rather take that smaller group of men that are going to be active and spend my time with them and enriching their Masonic journey than wasting my time on guys that I probably know won't be around in another eight months. Amen. Yeah. I mean, it's a work in progress. We get better and better at it every, every week, every month, every year. Uh, but it's certainly not a, a completed process, but it's, it's, it's something that should be considered by every lodge. You know, and I gotta say through each, through each step of this being initiated and then being passed and then being raised, I really did ask myself each time, why am I doing this? Um, and I gotta say in when I was, when I was raised on Monday, I, in the second part, when it all started out, I kind of sat there and went, oh, what, what the hell is going on here? What, what did I do? What did I do wrong? Yeah. And it all kind of came together and made sense right there at the end. Yeah. And I think that's something that a lot of folks should be asking themselves through each step of the process. Well, and, you know, if we don't allow time for it, if it's just a rush to get them through, you know, the candidate really doesn't have time for it, you know, and we just got to understand it's a unique process that works on each individual time. Cause I've seen guys come in like you and just blast through it all. And next thing you know, they're a master. And I, we've got guys that have been EAs for over three years that are still very active and they work on their work. You know, uh, maybe yep. not as consistently as they should, but they're still getting after it. And it's just the way their process is panning out. And we're cool with that. Yeah. You know, we work on their time when it comes to that, that process, you know, uh, you know, as far as getting raised, cause <clears throat> we're not going to tell you your year's almost up. You better hurry. That's not going to come out of our mouth. It's, right. Your year's almost up. Here's a form to give you another year. And, you know, I got to say that also, I think that um, when I was handed the petition, I was I was told that, oh, you don't ask for a petition. It just appears in front of you. And this mm -hmm. was within the group that I came in with. Um, having that happen, I think, makes it, it builds the confidence within you the wanting to continue with all of this and get as far as, as you possibly can. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. You've got a lot already invested in it, but you've already shown yourself that with a little time, patience and perseverance, you, you can overcome, you know, the obstacles Mason real put in front of you. Right. And patience is not a virtue that I contain. You know, I, I don't have that in droves by any yeah. means. Yeah, but I had to teach that to myself doing this. There is no doubt that's one thing masonry will teach you is patience. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, we still mail most of our forms by snail mail. <laughs> <laughs> Here, let me lick this stamp. Uh, to kind of wrap this up, I know we talked about the stats a little bit, but you know, these are some that I just kind of spitballed. You know, because I've got uh, the all the numbers in there and everything, but I didn't crunch them completely. I just kind of looked them over, but give or take, you know, from the uh, email, from the amount of men that email us that want to join, it's right around 60%, probably a little bit less that actually make it to petitioning the lodge and becoming a member, which is precisely what we had on EAs becoming masters. Uh, and now we see about probably closer to 95% of our EAs that become masters. Granted, that wow. can take a little while, 
but I'm not going to discount you if you've been an EA for three years, but you're still active. We still see you every other Monday, you know, uh, if not every Monday. That that guy we haven't lost, and he's going to progress. So we've we've literally flip flopped those numbers, um, you know. And when it comes to the guys that don't make it through, that's rarely dealt with at the ballot box. Typically, most of the guys just kind of disappear. We just don't see them. They quit coming up on that Monday. They figure out it's not for them or they don't have time for it, whatever it may be. They just kind of flutter away. Um, I can think of four or five instances to where we've had to tell guys, you know, that, you know, it's not the best time. Come back and, you know, sometimes we give them a time frame. Sometimes we don't. Um, But we've had to have those conversations, too, to where they keep coming up, but they're just not ready you know, it might be age, it might be job, might be new kid. You know, there's there's so many variables. Um, and then when it comes to active from the guys that we've raised, you know, because it used to be you get raised and, you know, if you didn't become an officer, it was usually a year, maybe a year and a half, and we'd just start seeing you less and less until we didn't see you anymore. Uh, that was probably – so we'd – out of Master Masons, we'd probably get about 30 to 40% that would stay active. And I'd say we're closer to 60% on that now. And I think that's a pretty dang good number. I don't think you'll ever achieve a high 80, 90%. And when I say active, I'm talking, you know, making it to more than just stated meetings that are there to help with degrees and things like that, you know. Um, where we used to have four or five guys on any given night like that, we'll have, you know, 12 to 15, uh, on a, what would you, you know, say, Rit? like on Monday nights, we, we probably do what about 47 to 50 Monday nights a year. Yeah, it's pretty close to that. It's about 45. Yeah. Cause we do every Monday except for holidays. So we're not, we're not, yeah. And, and my, well, my point in asking that question is to illustrate that that our lodge isn't just a lodge that's active on stated meetings once a month and that's it. Yeah. We literally are going up there every Monday for the only times that we're not there are on the mandated holidays from Grand Lodge uh, and the holidays that our temple is closed Yeah, and that we can't be up there. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's had surprising effects because, you know, when I, when we first had the idea to implement this process and to start it, uh, we were doing it all for out of safety concerns. We didn't think it, we didn't even think to think it would affect our, uh, stats on who stays active and progressing and things like that. But man, it has had a major effect on that. So... There's a lot of magic and mojo in that process, uh, you know, and that's why I wanted to go over it again, because not only are there crazies out there that this could help prevent, you know, uh, you getting them in your lodge and making them a Mason, but it's going to build a lot of value for guys that actually do become members. You know, if you, you, if you've got a system in place, doesn't have to be ours, doesn't even have to be close. It's just gotta be something. Make it thoughtful. Uh, if, if the, if the candidates sense that their experience from the petitioning process, the getting to know the brothers, all of that through their being raised to the the sublime degree, if they feel like it's a thoughtful process, it's going to have value. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they feel like it's haphazard, that they're you're just flying by the seat of your pants, and and it's not a system that makes sense to anybody then they're, they're going to sense it and they're going to see kind of a diminished value in it. Yeah. And those yeah. are the people that are probably going to fall off the bandwagon at some point. Yeah. It's so easy to check out at that point. You know, it's like, ah, eh, you know, they're half has in it. You know, I'm, I'm out. Well, yeah. I mean, once again, I can say I'm, I can personally attest to that. Yeah. Cause that's exactly what happened with me. Yeah. And you know, uh, you said it was 10 years ago that you first came up to 148. Yes. So that would have been 2010, maybe 2011. Yeah, anywhere from 2008 to 2010, somewhere in that time frame. <laughs> well, um, hopefully it was. I was master in 10, 11. <laughs> <But> <laughs> oh, I hello. Got, 
I got no. Wouldn't that have been funny if you were the elevator? We had to funny if you were the one stuffing a a a petition in his pocket, dude. (laughs) And trust me, I would not put it past you that it was me because that's the way we did things back then. You know, it was just ten years ago. It was as quick as we could get that petition out. That was just the mo. And, you know, like you said earlier, Evie, with the plane crashes, you know, we just started building off of each plane crash we had in that process to where we've come to this. And I I think it's really weird. I mean, because there's no way that we didn't meet at that point, Curtis. It's really weird. I'm trying to think back of like, because if I wasn't master, because I was senior warden in 09, 010, and then I was senior deacon in uh, 07, 08. And I was in every aspect of what that lodge was doing because there's only like six okay. of us there. That's interesting. I love it. I didn't even know that you'd had that experience, especially at our lodge before I had you on. I love that little twist. Is that? Yeah, I know, right? That definitely. Just, cross. Yeah, it drives the the nail home that what we're doing is <laughs> it's right. It's what we need. To right. Be doing. Exactly. Exactly. So you guys got any closing thoughts before we wrap this up? I, I, I do actually, um, I would like to say to anybody who's listening, any EAs or prospects or anybody who is currently just working through this, don't be intimidated. Um, everybody learns at their own pace and all of us are willing to help you out. And that is probably the best thing that I've found in all of this is I realize that I learn at my own pace and I realize that I learn in my own way, but it's helped me uh, help my fellow brothers do what they can do to learn all of this work. And it is, it is a lot of work and it requires the time you have to put the time in. Don't be intimidated by it. Yeah. I like that. Cause that made me kind of realize that, you know, all that time you guys were sitting out there. Oh, I say all, really after the first month or so where we start getting to know you, you know, we're all silently cheerleaders for you guys. Like, you know, man, I hope Curtis keeps coming up. We, we are having those conversations, you know, like I really like Justin, you know, I hope he sticks this process out. We want you to win, but we can't tell you that because it kind of defeats the purpose. Right. And you mentioning Justin helps a lot because, and I don't, I don't want to sound conceited about this, but I like to think that I helped Justin a whole lot on this journey and get into where he needed to be. It, yeah. it wasn't only me, but he and I played off of each other really well. And I kind of like to think that I drove him to learn more and faster. Yeah. That's, I mean, that is a beautiful example of how this thing works of making good men better. Cause Right. I'm I'm the best at sitting on that couch and watching Netflix. I'm mediocre. Oh, we all are. Yeah. I'm mediocre at my ritual. I am work. a gold I am a gold medal recipient of binge watching. Yeah. Monday morning quarterback. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you're not gonna get better until you get around other men that push you. You know, right. so that's an interesting take. Heavy, you good? I'm good. I've uh, gotten all my soap boxes out. <laughs> it sounds good. Well, the quote about the week that I have, this is a fraternal quote. I thought it fit so well, and I, I know everybody's heard it, and it's it's almost become uh, the cliche Masonic quote, but I love it. It's by Brother Albert Pike, and it's, what we have done for ourselves alone dies with us. What we have done for others in the world remains as in, and is immortal. And if you think about the process that we talked about tonight on bringing in new candidates for the future of our fraternity that will progress our fraternity long after we're gone, we are part of an immortal process. You know, Freemasonry has been around for over 300 years. Uh, that's getting that's getting into immortal territory. You know what I mean? We're keeping it alive. And we need to keep that, you know, in our thoughts when we're doing this, because who you initiate and into our craft is going to investigate the next guy who's going to investigate the next guy. And it's going to stem from where you set that bar. So keep that in mind. 
the process you're a part of is a big one. So if you want to contact us, check us out at fortworth148.org, our website there. You can contact us through there at Facebook. Uh, we're at Fort Worth Lodge 148, or you can email us at info148 at fortworth148.com or dot org. I'm sorry, info148 at fortworth148.org. <coughs> um, and then you can learn more about the Texas Masonicon event at texasmasonicon.com, and that's where the tickets will be sold for the Grand Lodge special that will go on purchase today that this is released. If it's not today, and uh, how many of us, uh, how many of us hosts are going to be at Grand Lodge? It's going to be me and you, Rit, mm -hmm. uh, Billy, and Gabe are both going to be there. So all those guys out there who are listening to this or listen to this podcast on the way to Grand Lodge, because I I know you're out there, come up to us, find us, say hello, um, let us know uh, what you think, and uh, give us some feedback. We're we're we are hungry for your feedback to to see what kind of uh, how we can make this podcast better for you. Yeah, there's going to, I think 13 of us are going from 148. So it's going to be a fun year. And we are literally staying next door to Grand Lodge. So come knock on the door and see us. Whoop, whoop. It, yeah, if you're like, what house are you talking about? It's the only house that is across the street from Grand Lodge. You can't miss us. Well, and unfortunately, I won't be going because I'm going to have to work and make sure that you guys have good beer for Grand Lodge. So <laughs> it's a trade off. And we. We appreciate that. Yeah, don't as you no, should. Don't want no sold beer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen, this has been great. This uh, my little setup here at the house has has uh, served us well tonight. So before we jinx it and make anything else uh, go wrong, this is Rip Moore signing off. This is Evie Kirkendall signing off, and this is Curtis Collier signing off. Thank you.